Welcome, everybody. Thank it's so you. good to be together again. Oh, it's strange to have to only do it once a month, and so I'm very grateful for this week. I'm actually rejoicing that we have a whole week together. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. So this is uh, the week of the Feast of Tabernacles, and um, I don't know if any of you saw, I started recording, um, maybe somebody in the line saw that. I was doing a live recording. Um, underneath the sukkah out there mm -hmm. so every year if you if you want to take time during this week at all you can go out there and sit and pray it's very nice and just quiet and peaceful the water running and and you can do that but in the mornings i'm taping a devotional um live on youtube so if you go to the trumpet and torch ministries youtube channel you can subscribe so you'll get them i was having technical difficulties this morning and of course on the being on a golf course we had the lawn mowers. <laughs> so it was just epic failure. On that. So I am going to try to record it again later this afternoon, but it was meant to be recorded early this morning so you would get it because our theme for this week is Joy Comes in the Morning from Psalm 35. So I apologize for that. That will be coming out. So you'll get that additional in, in your in the email inbox. And also, if you're not receiving the emails, please sign up on the Trump and Torch website, um, join the mailing list so that you can have that. But um, so this week, um, you know, it is the Feast of Tabernacles. It is a feast, a festival of joy. So that's going to be our focus Great for the whole week. And uh, we'll talk more as we go along. Um, and it goes along with what we're, where we are in Psalm 23 with the anointing um, mm -hmm. of the Lord's oil. And we know that that anointing that God has given us is the Holy Spirit. So mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit produces joy. So we'll talk about that. But let's go ahead and open up in prayer. And we'll dive right into our study. <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and just read Psalm 30 um, as we open in prayer. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive and I should not go down, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face and I was troubled. I cried to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare the truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory be praise to you and not be silent. O oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Beautiful song. So Lord, we are so grateful for your loving kindness every morning and your faithfulness every night. Joy to tabernacle with you in the season of joy and feast on divine love, Lord. We delight in all your goodness that flows from your heart of love into ours and brings us a taste of heaven into our hearts, Lord. We ask that you would just tune our heart streams to your song of joy and clear away any cloud of despair because we want our lives to show forth the greatness of your love toward us, the cheerfulness of our heart to testify to the grand message of your glad tidings that you have brought us and our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that right now you just bring us up into that rarefied air of rejoicing where we find our heart's delight in gazing upon you and not our present circumstances. May our lives bring forth that sweet melody of holy joy as we feast on your word today and you fill us with the fullness of yourself. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that is tender and ready to obey the instruction you have for us today. And we will praise you, O Lord, with our whole hearts. We will tell of your marvelous works and be glad and rejoice in you. We will sing praises to your name, O Most High. Wonderful name for Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. Amen. Um, so as I said, this week is the seven day Feast of Tabernacles. Um, it is a feast of joy, um, the festival of joy, and, and it commemorates the Israelites wandering in the wilderness um, when they lived in tents those 40 years and the Lord himself dwelt in their midst in the glory of the tabernacle. Uh, so that's what they're commemorating. That's what they're looking to. And it actually is three great pilgrimage feet that are required written in the book of in Deuteronomy. Um, someone's making some background noise. If you could check your audio and turn it off, please mute yourself online. Thank you. Um, and um, these three pilgrimage feasts, which is the Passover feast, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. This was a time when all the male, the Jewish males would have to show themselves in Jerusalem and present themselves at that, those great feasts. And uh, we know that our Lord himself did, uh, our Lord Jesus did when he had his earthly pilgrimage here. And the one feast that will remain in the millennial kingdom is actually this, this feast of tabernacles. So it, um, all the other um, festivals, we, we, there's a belief that the first three were already fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, and the last three will be filled, fulfilled when the church is raptured and Jesus returns, and then we'll have the millennial reign of the Lord. And so this feast will actually be celebrated then. Actually, let me just read from it. It's in Zechariah. Um, it's, it's just a beautiful ending to that, um, um, the Lord's reign with his people. So in Zechariah 14, it says that it will come to pass, this is verse 16 of chapter 14 in Zechariah, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, if you think about it, the millennial kingdom when the Lord reigns on earth and we're going to be celebrating this feast. And so that's why we're commemorating and why it's important that we do. Um, even though, you know, we are, we're not true Israelites or Jewish, you know, we still as Christians, we celebrate it and looking forward to that day when, when all the nations of the earth will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They will come under um, the care of the Lord and they will acknowledge him as that. So it, it's going to be beautiful. So one of the things that they do uh, to commemorate this time of feasting, these seven days is, uh, and this is in the scriptures, it tells them that they're supposed to go out and bring forth boughs of branches, palm branches, um, branches of fruit trees and create these temporary structures, mm -hmm. booths, they're called booths or sukkahs. Um, and they put them in their backyards or, or in Israel, they might put them on their roofs. Um, or in, if they if they're not from Jerusalem, they don't live there, and they're coming from a distance, they'll actually build their booths in the in the town square. That's what they'll do, and they will live in those for that that time frame. And and usually, what you would do, you would invite people um, to your home in the evenings to enjoy a meal. You would eat your meals in the sukkah, and so that's what we have out there. So our sukkah is actually kind of a permanent structure. Um, it came with the house. It is a beautiful trellis that's covered with grape um, vines, and they're fruitless though, so it's just um, leaves. Um, but it's really just really beautiful and peaceful out there if you have a chance to go out there and, and bask in that. Um, so what it does is it reminds them that God was the one that was protecting them and covering them and preserving them. He was their shelter all those 40 years in the wilderness. And he walked with them by the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He was there. His presence was with them. And uh, we have so much more to celebrate as Christians, right? Because the one who became flesh and tabernacled with us, right, is Jesus himself. He came in human flesh. And uh, in order that he could tabernacle with us, but also that in his, his sacrifice, his death, and his resurrection, he was able to give us his Holy Spirit who tabernacles with us. So he tabernacles with us as believers um, within these, these tiny tabernacles of, of our, our spirits, our souls, and he lives with us through the presence of his Holy Spirit. And we'll talk more about that as, as the week goes on. But so we have so much more to rejoice at. So you can understand, why is it a season of joy? It's like the joy of all of God's blessings and his provision. Uh, and it's not just that he's carried us through all the difficulties and trials of our life or that he's brought us salvation, but he dwells within us. So his constant joy is with us. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today, um, this tabernacling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Um, and so, uh, you know, this 
And Psalm 23, verse 5, uh, and we're on part B, and tomorrow we'll talk more about that. The Lord says, that, it says in the scripture, you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. So it's this irrepressible fountain of anointing and blessing that the Lord gives us. And it's endless. It's eternal. And that's what's so beautiful about it. And that's, we have this abundance of spiritual joy. And it comes to us through the Holy Spirit. In Romans 14, 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the kingdom of God, what Jesus brought, and he was confronted about that all the time. Remember, even his followers thought that he was bringing uh, a kingdom into the world where they would have to re revolutionize and fight and get their weapons and, and then he would take over Rome. But he's like, no, um, this this kingdom is invisible. It's internal um, and it's eternal. And so the kingdom of God doesn't consist of all these external realities that are here. They're spiritual. And so things like righteousness, right? Holiness and joy that comes from the spirit. And so the fruit of the spirit is joy. We read that in Galatians 5.22, right? Um, it's, it's a fruit of the Spirit. And this joy that this the Holy Spirit produces in our life, th this, is, this is not an external joy that you get from temporal pleasures, you know, things that you seek after selfishly. This is something that's produced inside of you. Um, and and it's, it's a slow process, a slow production as the Holy Spirit is working the word of truth in our lives and sanctifying us and conforming us to the image of our Lord. And it comes forth from that. Uh, there's a tremendous just peace and joy that flows from a life that's totally yielded to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so we can understand you know, why, why this joy just comes forth from us. Um, because there's no longer the flesh at war within us and it's the spirit itself just flowing in us. Luke 17, 21 and 22 tells us that the kingdom of God does not come with careful careful observation, nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you. So here Jesus is telling the Pharisees this. It is a spiritual and internal kingdom, not an external or physical one. And remember, Jesus even rebuked the Pharisees. He, he told them, you, know, you need to clean the inside of the cup first. Mm. You want the outside of the cup to look right? You're just whitewashed tombs. We don't want to be whitewashed tombs. <laughs> we want to yield to the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is the gift that the Father has sent to us through the sacrifice of his son when he was glorified and exalted in heaven. When Jesus got there, he was able to release the Holy Spirit in order that he would do this inner work within us and build our character and conform it to the character of Jesus Christ. In John 18, 36, Jesus um, actually answered, this is Pilate. Remember, Pilate was questioning him before his crucifixion. He said, and Jesus said, my kingdom, because he's like, are you a king? And Jesus is like, my kingdom is not of the world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So he makes it clear that the kingdom that he was bringing into the world had nothing to do with earthly kingdoms. And that's what's so beautiful when we talk about the Feast of Tabernacles, that the last feast that will be celebrated for a thousand years on this earth will be the Feast of Tabernacles. Because all these other kingdoms, all these other leaders, all these other kings, all these other rulers, they're going to come and they're going to worship the Lord, the true king of glory. I mean, think about that. That alone, when we talk about this, this eternal joy, this inner joy, um, and, and we sometimes we get so focused in you know, tunnel vision on our, our circumstances, where we are presently, our trials, our temptations, our distresses, our despairing, um, all of our problems, all these worldly struggles and weights. Um, you know, it's like the Lord it gives us this beautiful picture and view of like what's coming and, 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 and that should be our joy, the joy of seeing the name of our Lord exalted, right? Philippines to, you know, it's like we, we want to see every knee bow. We want to see our Lord uh, receiving the reward <laughs> for his, you know, sacrifice, his travail. And, and that should bring us joy, not about what we do. Uh, not even about what God's doing in us, but the very fact that our Lord is being exalted, will be exalted, and um, people will, will come to worship him um, forever. So it's it's a beautiful thing. Um, so when Jesus said in John 18, you know, telling Pilate, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, my people would fight, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to touch me if it was, you know. Um, 
the thing is, is this, this, we need to remember that as we pray about advancing the kingdom of God in this world, and we pray that, and Lord, advance your kingdom in this world, you know, bring your kingdom into this world. It's like, it's not about worldly revolution. You know, we're not trying to turn over earthly kingdoms. We're not doing that. You know, Satan is given a little bit of, you know, on the leash. He's allowed to reign. He's allowed to prowl all around like a roaring lion. The Lord allows that. He, allow, he allows him, you know, to sift us or to test. You know, these things happen. The Lord allows it. Um, so our job is not to go about trying to turn over these earthly kingdoms or anything like that. Um, our job, as those who have the kingdom of God within us, is that growth of the kingdom within us, right? It's this slow, steady process of growth of the kingdom of God taking over our lives, right? And that people can see that, and 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 they 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 they're able to see what God is doing in our lives. There's a total transformation, and then it's a kingdom that they can't conquer. So like the Lord said was like, the, 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 nothing will be able to prevail in my church, right? And you can't conquer my church. You're not, you can't conquer my people. Nothing can snatch them out of my hand. Why? Because the kingdom of God has been rooted in us and is, and is growing. I mean, think about it. An entire kingdom <laughs> is at work within you. And it's it's a powerful thing. And the king is seated on the throne. As long as we're not getting in his way, right? Because there are some people who try to usurp the Lord's throne. We do that all the time. We're all guilty of it. We try to usurp God's authority in our life. That's why we need to yield. He's, yield to him. He's our king. He's the king. Let him have his way. Let him sit on the throne of our hearts. Let him rule and reign there and submit to him. And he's never going to hurt us or harm us or lead us astray. He's going to lead us in ways of righteousness and holiness and godliness. And he's going to be able to advance his kingdom in our lives in order that we can advance his kingdom in the world. Um, so let me read from John 15, because this is how it happens. How does this kingdom grow in our hearts? Where, how, where does it come from? Now I'm going to go to John chapter 15. Uh, chapter of the book of John we're all very familiar with it's the vine um, and the branches um, we're all very familiar with this I'm going to read um, actually verses 1 through 8 of John chapter 15 I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. This is where the fruit comes from. It comes from abiding in the true vine, which is Jesus Christ, right? So, so when we talk about this spiritual fruit, um, this fruit of joy that, that we're given in the Holy Spirit, um, it is a result of a process. And, you know, we're going to talk more about... Um, uh, the anointing, you know, we read, we just read here about um, the pruning. You know, if you're bearing fruit, this is, this was interesting. If you're a fruitful tree, you're, I mean, if you, if you ever been, you know, a person who gardens, stuff, you, you actually go ahead and you prune it, right? You, you, my rose bushes get really big and I prune them right back down to the ground. You know, it's like, and they just keep coming back. It's like huge, right? Um, why, why does he do that? You know, and tomorrow we'll look at that when we're going, doing Psalm 23, um, and we're looking at that oil of anointing that the shepherd puts on the sheep, right? He does it, what, to keep the bugs and the pests away, right? He's, he's doing that. And that's what God's doing when he prunes us. He's, he's trimming off all of those areas that could get disease. Uh, I always, I always think of it like this. You know, we, we begin to grow and bloom and blossom in our ministry and our calling and our life. And, and sometimes you, get, you go that mountaintop of transfiguration, right? You have this total spiritual high. And all of a sudden, you feel yourself in this deep place of depression, right? We think of the story of Elijah, right? Here he is. He, he goes to Mount Carmel, and he defeats all of these prophets of Baal. And the next thing we know, he's tucking tail and running from Jezebel. Like, what in the world? But this is so true of our walk with the Lord, right? Because it's, the Lord wants to remind us <laughs> whose we are. 
um, and that it is him working in us. We're not doing it. It's a divine process that's happening within us. We can make, take no glory for it. We can take no credit for it. So when all of a sudden all of our, our beautiful branches start blossoming and blooming, beautiful cherry blossoms, they're so beautiful, and fruit that is so just delicious, God's going to come along and chop it right off because if it's getting in the way of people seeing him. Mm -hmm. People are not to look at us, people not to admire us, people not, you know, not to follow after us, not after a name, not for anything. They're to see Jesus in us. That's the spiritual fruit. That's what needs to come forth. And um, you know, and again, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. So um the way we we produce this spiritual fruit um is by tabernacling, right? He says you abide. Abiding is tabernacling. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. That's why the Lord set up the tabernacle back in 2018. It's a place to just come and abide in the presence of God, to feed on his word, uh, to get that spiritual nourishment we need, to get that cultivating and watering and pruning and refining that needs to happen in our lives, to learn to just abide more fully in the Lord, to yield to the Holy Spirit um, in order that we can go out and bear fruit to the Father's glory. That's what we're called to do here. So, um, and so we do that. He wants to take us deeper and deeper, more intimate into the Holy of Holies with him, into that place of dependence and trust. And that's what the Israelites were reminded of when they were celebrating this Feast of Tabernacles. It was a reminder, do you not remember how you had to totally be dependent upon the Lord? You could do nothing in your own. You relied on him and he worked in miraculous ways. He brought water out of a rock. He brought manna from heaven. Your shoes didn't even wear out. Your clothes didn't wear out for 40 years. Can you imagine that? You're wearing the same sandals. They never wear out. Your shoe, your 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 clothes, they never just melt away from moss or being worn down. I mean, it's miraculous what God does. And so it's a reminder of that, that we are totally dependent upon him. So I want to look at, um, as we're, you know, we're kind of getting close to the end here. Um, actually, no, we have a little bit of time. Galatians um, 5. I would like us to go there because I want us to see the fruit of the Spirit. So mm -hmm. if you could go to Galatians <clears throat> chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 22 and 23. So Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Now notice that it says fruit and not fruits. Okay, so the spirit, the fruit of the, the fruit of the spirit is singular. It's a singular fruit, right? It's not multiple fruits, it's one fruit, just like the triune God is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so as we look at this verse, we can kind of see um, almost like triplets in in this. So there's love, joy, and peace. There's long suffering, kindness, and goodness. And then there's faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. So I want to look at that first that first triplet, that love, joy, and peace. Mm -hmm. um, now we know according to the scripture that Galatians Colossians three fourteen says above all things, above all things, put on love. Right? Love. It's the root. It's it's the grounding of everything. Um, and uh, out of it, out of this love, love, which is that it, that is the character of God, character of God is love, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So this is the bond of perfection. Love is the bond of perfection. And out of it, we see that that's where the fruit of the spirit yeah. starts. If you miss this, you can't get the other. <laughs> you have you have to have the first. And, and so... Um, you can't, you cannot advance in joy. You cannot advance in peace. You cannot advance in patience if you don't have love, right? Love, love is the bond of all of it. Matthew 22 tells us, you know, Jesus told us the greatest commandment. What is it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then the second, it's just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? So the, all of it comes out of love. That's the bond. And so, all of our future growth in holiness and godliness and righteousness, it begins in love. It's rooted and grounded in there. That's why we abide in the vine. We abide in the place of deep, um, dependent love. And, and, and nothing should get in the way of that with the Lord. Um, but, but look and see, after love comes what? Joy. I mean, that's that. So there's something important about that, that the spirit is telling us. 
um, where all of our joy comes from. It's not an earthly temporal joy. It's an eternal fruit of the spirit. Um, Psalm 34 through five. That's our key verse for this week of the Feast of Tabernacles. It says, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but what comes in the morning? Joy. 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 So what come, what come, what precedes joy? Weeping. Weeping. There needs to be sorrow, right? There has to be. I mean, so so often we think, oh, you know, we 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 tend to want to in the world that we live, the culture, you know, it's like you, you need to be happy, you need to be happy, you know, and 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 you know, you, you don't want to be a in a depressed spirit, you don't want to be in a sad state. Um when when the the reality is for the Holy Spirit to produce joy in our life, he actually first instills sorrow, right? He brings us to a place of sorrow over what? Our sin. He, he, he makes us aware of our sinfulness, of, of, of our rebellion. He does that. He has to do that. Um, he makes us sorrow for our sins. It says um, godly sorrow works repentance, right? And it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. So it's his kindness that causes us to weep over our sins. It's his kindness that brings us to a place of sorrow. And so we should not kick at the goads of that. We should be like, okay, if we come to a, a time in our journey of faith where there is maybe a stillness or quietness or a, a, a kind of maybe a distressing or a despairing, like like David, you know, he, he says in the song, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. It's like we need to get to that place. Oftentimes we, again, with the spiritual fruit, we can get, we can advance so far in our walk with God that we can all of a sudden become kind of self-sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. And we forget how utterly dependent we are. Again, the Feast of Tabernacles, every year, an annual reminder, you are dependent upon God for everything, your food, your clothing, your shelter, your very life is dependent upon God. That's why we celebrate it. And that's what we need to be reminded of. Um, we don't produce any of this, of this in ourselves. We need to remember that. Um, so this godly sorrow, this weeping that comes in the night um, is replaced with joy in the morning, joy of our salvation, joy and forgiveness of sin, joy of, of being reconciled to the Father, right? It's such a beautiful thing. So when we really when we really begin to meditate on what this fruit of joy is, where it comes from, and what it took to produce it in our lives, it's a powerful thing. So, you know, we are we are to be a joyful people. God is a joyful God. Right. He, he, he we, you know, many people have in their mind that he's this, you know, angry, evil, like just wants to just chastise and, and correct. But he's actually, as we've been going through this 23rd Psalm, we're learning how great his care is toward us, how great his kindness and how tender and merciful he is. He's so careful and loving and kind toward us. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we be, he wants us to have the joy that flows from him. To have the love that flows from him, to have the peace that it all it all comes from him, right? So that's what we that's what we learn about joy. Um, I'm going to read Isaiah 61 verse three. This goes along, uh, and, we'll, and we'll probably touch on this scripture many times throughout our journey this week. Um, but Isaiah 61 three, uh, another scripture we're all familiar with, a beautiful, beautiful scripture. This talks about our Lord. Um, this is the one that he read. Um, Jesus read in the synagogue after he came out of uh, the wilderness being tempted by the devil. He was led by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. Remember that. It's the spirit that leads us to this place of sorrow, uh, of, of testing, all of that. Jesus came out of that. He went, goes into the tabernacle. They hand him the scroll and it opens right to this actual scripture. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, 
that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Um, so hmm. God gives us this oil, which again, tomorrow when we talk about him anointing our head with oil, he gives us this oil <laughs> for our mourning and he gives us a garment of praise for our spirit of heaviness. So even when we're walking through those dark valleys of sorrow or suffering or heaviness or distresses, um, again, we're not to be looking at our circumstances. Our joy is not dependent on our circumstance, right? It's dependent on our God. Yes. He's seated on the throne. He's a sovereign king. And his kingdom was within us. <laughs> He's ruling and reigning here. We need to remember that. So, and allow him to bring that joy to our heart and, um, and to give us that uh, garment of praise, to give us um, that oil of joy. And that should be the desire of, of all of our hearts, right? Um, to to not have this counterfeit joy that the world offers us, right? It's just this temporal joy. And it's again, it's all very selfish. Um, but to desire the genuine, sacred, holy, delicious fruit of joy in order that we can bring it to others. Um, so I just want to tap, touch on a couple of things um, about what this spiritual fruit of joy is. That's our focus today is this, this spiritual joy, spiritual joy. What is it? Um, for one, um, it is our portion. This is what God gives to us. Again, God wants us to be a happy people. He wants us to be a jo joyful people. So he's the one that applies the oil of joy. He applies it to us. Um, and, and it says in John 15, right, that he's glorified when we bring forth much fruit. It's when we bear that fruit, this fruit of joy and, and, and immeasurable joy, um, it, it glorifies the Father. Right. And so we want to be doing that. And so the mark of a true Christian is that that inner joy that comes from within. Uh, if you think about Acts in Acts 16, if you remember the story of Paul and Cyrus, Silas, they are um, in, you know, they're in their stockades. They're they're in prison. Um, but again, their joy was not dependent on their circumstance. They were singing for the joy of the Lord, right? They were rejoicing that they were chosen to suffer for the name of Christ. Um, and, and we grumble and complain over, you know, the slightest thing. We're all, we're all, we're all guilty of it. Um, <laughs> you know, we have to remember in the first century at the birth of the church, that all of the, these disciples, the apostles, the disciples, all these followers of Jesus, they were tortured afflicted and persecuted men, but they counted it all joy that they could suffer. And again, we'll touch on that later in the week as well. That's going to be one of our joys, the joy of suffering. Um, and, and, and so they rejoiced in that they, because we need to, we possess a joy, a joy that the world does not have. And we need to recognize that we don't respond like the world does to their trials and tribulations. We don't do that. We respond as, as, as a child of God, just like Paul and Silas, just like the first, uh, all the persecuted saints throughout history, who, who even, they were burned at the stake, stake and they, they were singing praises to God. Um, that's how we're supposed to be. Our joy, God has planted it within us and brings it forth in us so that in our time of sorrow, we can have a cheerful heart, right? We can rejoice um, so that, our trials won't be so heavily burdened. He says to us in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. So take off this spirit of heaviness. Take it off. Mm -hmm. Lay it on the Lord and put on his yoke. He says, my yoke is light. Mm -hmm. It's light. Put it on. This garment a praise. Mm -hmm. That's all. Go forth praising, rejoicing. Doesn't mean that in your circumstances you're supposed to go like, you know, like that person's crazy. They're, you know, they just got this horrible diagnosis and they're walking around like nothing's. No, I mean it's like there's just this inner joy that's just like peace, you know, and 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 rejoice and say, okay, Lord, you're in control. Remembering, He's the one in control. He know He He sets our times. He know He knows our times, and we need to just trust Him in that. Um, if you want a good place to look, uh, you know, when you're in your time of distress, go to the Psalms. I always read the Psalms every day. I mean, here was, you know, David, he, he, he wrote most of them, many of them. Um, and, you know, he was a hunted man. He was a hounded man. He was a sinful man. <laughs> um, and yet he always had praise on his lips to the Lord. So I encourage you, read the Psalms mm -hmm. every day. One of the Psalms. I mean, if you ever do those yearly Bibles or through the Bible readings each year, always every day, there's always like a psalm as part of them. 
And there's a reason for that. We need to rejoice in that. If you if you want to, in this season of anointing, um, I'll put this in tomorrow's email for the our Lord is our shepherd journey. Um, I did uh, back in 20, 2018, when the Lord was inaugurating the tabernacle season, um, the 300 days leading up to the launching of it, uh, the Lord had me write the 300 days of anointing. It's a YouTube prayer journey. So you can go 300 days through all the Psalms and you listen to the Psalms. And many people have told me, you know, that they put them to sleep. Um, you know, and that's a great way to go to bed at night, you know, listen to them and go to bed, just hearing the word of God wash over you and just a spirit of praise filling your thoughts as you go to bed instead of all the worries of the day, mm -hmm. just like take them off, <laughs> put them on the Lord and be filled with praise. So it's a beautiful thing to do. Um, so one, another thing to remember about trees, fruit trees, do they always bear fruit? Are they bearing fruit all year round? Yeah. No, right? Trees, you know, they bear fruit in season and then they lose their leaves. They become dormant, right? We see them. Everything gets all brown and crusty in the fall and winter. Everything looks dry and brittle. Um, but there's this hope and joy of what the springtime is going to bring and then the summer harvest, right? Summer and fall harvest. So we need to remember um, that there are going to be seasons in our journey where there are going to be those down times, those still times, those dormant times. And we're all, and some people you can even get, and we read it, David felt it, Elijah felt it, you know, Paul felt it. Every one of the greats in the Bible, you read it, they all went through those seasons where they felt like, where is God? Mm -hmm. I'm alone. I want to die. <laughs> right. We're going to go through that. But again, our joy is not dependent on our circumstances. And so all of these men, all these great men and women of the scriptures and the Bible, these heroes of the faith, um, they, they, they really are um, a symbol um, and a memorial of the, just the joy of the Lord as their strength, as they journeyed through whatever the Lord was taking them through, and they were victorious in that. Um, so, you know, our souls need seasons of rest. You know, we can't always be going at full speed. Yes, there are a few of those people in the world <laughs> that just seem to be joyful at all times, in all circumstances. They have so much energy. You just don't know what to do with them. Um, but for most of us, we're going to go through those seasons where we just have, um, you know, a time of rest where God wants us to be still and know that he is God. Psalm 46, 10, right? We don't always have to be running ourselves weary, running around. Um, we sometimes so, sometimes it's good to feel that dark night of the soul, right? That sinking of the soul, right? Uh, when you're when you're in that place where you feel just that that desperation, it reminds you when you come back out into the light. I I mean I felt it a lot the last five weeks with just the vertigo, like not having control of my body, to be completely unbalanced, dizzy. And just struggling, feeling like you're like wearing cement boots and trying to climb upstream and everything's just rushing at you. And you're just like, I'm so tired of it. I'm just so tired. I'm so weary. I just want to be able to stand up straight and make it to the bathroom. <laughs> and yeah, it's just like, and then the release, like the moment the release came, you're just like, you don't even remember it. And that it's and 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 we'll talk about this too. That is what the Lord compares, you know, to our trials to a woman in childbirth, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You're we, you know, that that burden upon the body and the stress and the strain of labor and the endurance that is necessary. It's like running a marathon. Right. You're an Olympic champion as a woman given birth. And then once the baby comes forth, just joy and explicit right, just comes forth and you forget maybe a few months later, but you forget because then you wouldn't have more children if you didn't forget. Uh, but we forget. Um, so the other thing to remember is that that joy is usually most often produced in the times of distress. It doesn't typically come in our times of great prosperity, right? Mm -hmm. It's in our times of distress that that fruit of joy is produced. You think about like um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, they went into the fiery furnace and it was there in the midst of that dark trial um, that the Lord was with them in the midst of it. And we need to remember that in the very dark seasons and the very distressing seasons, in the height of our greatest persecutions, and trials, God is there in the midst of us. Um, and, and you know, it has nothing to do with, our joy isn't gonna come from our circumstances. 
God is right there with us. Look to him, keep our eyes fixed upon him. So we need to remember that our joy, um, it doesn't come from what we have. It comes from what we are. And it doesn't come from where we are, but from whose we are, mm. right? Um, Habakkuk actually says it really great. I'm going to read him. Habakkuk 3, um, he has this at the very end of his book, this hymn of faith. It's really beautiful. I, it says here, it's Habakkuk 3, verses 17 to 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no fruit, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like the deer's feet and he will make me to walk on my high hills. Again, not dependent upon our circumstances. Uh, as we look around, everything that's happening in the world and everything seems to be falling apart. God's bringing it all together and he's making us more steadfast and secure. He's working his kingdom within us. And so we can go forward triumphantly in that. Um, and um, just you know, maybe one last thing here. Um, again, all, all the conflict that happens without, there's also a conflict that happens within us. And this is from 2 Corinthians uh, 4. And uh, it talks about this treasure that we have within us. Remember, uh, the joy is within us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 7 to 11. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed. Mm -hmm. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Mm -hmm. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Mm -hmm. We are struck down, but we are not destroyed. Always, always caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. The life of Jesus, the life of love, of joy, of peace, all of it, it's coming forth from us. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. That's what God, the kingdom of God is working in us. The kingdom is within you. The life of Jesus is within you. You're going to be hard pressed. You're going to be uh, persecuted, but you're never going to be abandoned. Nobody can pluck you from the hand of God. Um, he will hold you. We are always sorrowful. We're often sorrowful, but always rejoicing. We struggle at times, but we are victorious. And we may be troubled, but we will be triumphant. Amen. Uh, First Peter 1 8, um, Peter speaks of this joy, uh, unspeakable and full of glory. Um, mm -hmm. So we're just let's just remember from the moment of our salvation, this joy. Um, it comes to us when we first believe. Uh, if you think about the angels when they announce the Lord's birth, right? What they say, I bring you good tidings of great joy, right? The good tidings, that's the gospel message. So we don't even have to speak a word on our lips. If we would just live in a spirit of joy, allow that fruit to come forth from our lives. We are proclaiming the gospel message just in the way that we live. And that's what the Lord wants us to be. He wants us to be a happy, holy, joyful people, right? So that we proclaim the message of Jesus wherever we go. And without even having to speak a word, let our lives, the way we live our lives, be our greatest testimony, our greatest sermon. That's what they should be. Um, so I guess we will go to prayer then. Um, and as we're running out of time here, we'll take these last few minutes here. Um, so again, as, as we're focusing on this season of joy, uh, today was about the spiritual joy where it comes from the fruit of the spirit is joy. Um, we'll go further into that, the anointing that is upon us that God gives us. We'll do that tomorrow. Um, and so let's just take a moment um, to pray really pray for this spirit of joy. Because honestly, it, it just really seems today that there are so many believers that just walk around in a depressed state, that the people of God are not a joyful people, that they're a angry, complaining, whining lot, which is exactly what Israel was, right, in the wilderness. They just grumbled and complained their way all the way through those 40 years, you know, and God was nothing but good to them. 
He blessed them abundantly. And that's where we dwell in that place of God's goodness and faithfulness. That's what our journey through the 23rd Psalm is so much showing us. We are under an open heaven. We have the favor of God upon us. And we should be a joyful people. And 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 we shouldn't be grumbling and complaining and whining along the way. Um, you know, people people should know that there's something different about us. It's the mark of a Christian. That that that's true spiritual joy that is produced by the Holy Spirit. You know, you, you want to talk about a mark of the Holy Spirit. You know, everyone has their idea of what what like a mark of a person is the Holy Spirit. Joy should be it, right? That is the mark. And and if you see a Christian who's without joy, then you need to question what's going on in their life. We need to be a joyful people. So let's go ahead and take a moment and pray and um, just pray in the spirit of praise. Let's thank God for the season of joy. Let's thank him for the time that we're going to have together this week. And let's pray for that spirit of joy to come forth in the body of Christ in the church, um, because I think that's where we're going to see the church triumphant. That's where we're going to see a true revolution happen in this world and the turning over of the tables when people go forth with joy in their hearts. Mm -hmm. So, And if you want to pray online, just un unmute yourself and join us in prayer. But let's take these last few moments just to go before the Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, it is good to give thanks to you, Lord, and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Lord, we praise you, Lord. Um, for this season of joy that you have given us. Lord, thank you for these feasts, Lord. We're so grateful for the things that you put on our calendars, Lord, to bring us back to that place of dependence upon you, to remember um, what, a, what a great God you are, what, what a gracious heavenly father you are, what a faithful and good shepherd you are to us, Lord, that we, Lord, are under your tender and merciful care, Lord. You, you love us, Lord, so deeply. You adore us, Lord. You care so greatly for us, Lord. And so we just want to praise you um, for this season of joy, Lord, that, that Lord, you would um, root us more firmly in you, that we, we would abide more closely in the vine, that we would remain in you, God, and to feed on you, Lord. Lord, that, that your sap would just pour through every pore in our body, Lord, so that we would Lord, produce that fruit. And it doesn't come from us. It comes from our stillness and our waiting upon you to do it in our lives. So give us a yielded heart, Lord. God, I pray for that for the entire body of Christ, Lord, that every joint and ligament, every muscle, every organ, <laughs> whatever body part it is in the body of Christ, Lord, that everyone would yield um, and to remain in the vine, to draw the strength from you, Lord, so that we can be a strong, healthy, whole and holy body that brings glory to the Father, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for filling us with your joy. We thank you, Lord, that today we go out in the joy of the Lord as our strength, Lord. Um, it doesn't come from us, Lord. So we are before you now. And God, just speak to our hearts, fill them with your joy, and show us how, Lord, to express that joy to others, Lord, wherever we go, that they too Lord, would be, Lord, uh, drawn by that intoxicating fruit, <laughs> Lord, of the spirit and desire, it, Lord. Um, let, let, let us be, Lord, totally irresistible. Make you irresistible in this world, Lord Jesus. In your mighty name, I pray. Mm -hmm. Blender and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Lord, we thank you for your clothed us with garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness, Lord. Lord, let our lives, Lord, reflect, Lord, your beauty and your majesty and your strength. And let our lips always be filled with joy and praise to you, Lord Jesus. God, I ask, Lord, for your people that you would, that the God of hope would fill them with all the joy and peace as they trust in you, Lord, and that they would overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we praise you for your goodness and faithfulness in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for the word of God, which is our necessary meat and drink, Lord. 
we've been nourished in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, let us go forth in that strength, Lord, and be a blessing to others, Lord Jesus, as we proclaim the goodness of your name. In your great and holy and worthy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Blessings, all our